Good evening, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome to Conversations in the Digital Age. Tonight's show is about our negotiations with Iran over its nuclear program. Are we about to enter into a good deal, a bad deal, or is any deal better than no deal at all? Here tonight to answer these questions is an expert in the field. He is Leslie Gelb. Les Gelb is the President Emeritus of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's had a distinguished career with senior positions in government. He has been the diplomatic correspondent for the New York Times. And he is now an ardent contributor to the Daily Beast, where he has written on the subject of Iran. Les, we're delighted to have you with us. Good to be here, Jim. Now, tell us, the last report as of this conversation is there's no deal has been struck yet. But uh, the parties are in uh, Geneva, the permanent five members of the Security Council, plus Germany and they're negotiating with the Iranians. Uh, how do you think things stack up? I think there's much more talk about this negotiation outside the negotiations mm -hmm. than inside the negotiations. And almost all of it is wrong or terribly incomplete. And it's hard to get a good picture of what's going on unless you're following this with great care. And. Uh, the last we heard is that the parties are uh, uh, haggling about the details. They're close to an agreement. Uh, maybe the devil is in the detail, but uh, still no agreement. And the last we heard is that there's, the Iranians are complaining that there are disagreements among the Western parties. Well, the, the devil is not so much in the details as in the politics. I think what what really constitutes the heart of the problem in these negotiations is not so much the specifics under negotiation because they're sensible but modest. It's the politics. It's what's going on back in Tehran and in Washington where there is so much opposition to what's going on and so many misstatements about what's being negotiated. Uh, now, where is the opposition in Washington coming from, and uh, what are the misstatements? It's coming from Democrats and Republicans, both. And the funnel is largely because of the Israelis. Uh, the Israelis have taken a, a position of outright opposition to this, and they have been the source of many of the misstatements of the negotiations. Now, what are the misstatements? First and foremost is that the United States is giving up its leverage. It's going to give up its sanctions regime, the, sa the economic sanctions that brought Iran to the table in the first place. We're going to give it all away in this interim agreement. I would say that is almost entirely wrong. Uh, the sanctions that we are going to give up are rather modest. Six and, billion dollars? What's a few billion dollars between friends? Yeah, you know, it's six to ten billion dollars or whatever of Iran's own money that we had frozen in banks around the world. So these are banking sanctions, not oil sanctions. The, these are money sanctions. In fact, there are a whole range of other banking and financial sanctions and oil sanctions that are totally untouched by these negotiations. All those sanctions are still in place and will be in place if and when this agreement is reached. What's more, even if we did make a concession, say, on the, their use of banks overseas or uh, allow them to sell some oil and we found out that they cheated, we could reimpose all those sanctions the very next day. So That wouldn't violate the agreement. If they did things that violated the agreement... And we'd, they might. We'd be relieved. We would be in a position to reimpose the sanctions the very next day. So economic sanctions are the kind of things you really don't lose if you're keeping track of what the other guy is doing, if he's complying. And if you find out he isn't, you put the sanctions back on. Bang. 
Now you, uh, so what you're saying is there's really very little downside to uh, the United States in, in entering of, into this interim agreement. In terms of the sanctions, Would, because we'd be giving up little or nothing. Now what are we say. gaining in return? Well, we're gaining a uh, freeze on most of Iran's nuclear activities, particularly a freeze on their continuing to enrich up to some some point that's uh, not specified yet. I think it's still under negotiations. And we're getting agreement that they wouldn't uh, add to their stockpile of uh, centrifuges to spin uh, enriched uranium. And we probably will get something on their reprocessing plant as well. Now, is What about this, the heavy water plant in, uh, in Iraq? Right. That, Iraq. That's, that's a plutonium plant. Yeah, plutonium plant. plant. And we probably will get something on that where they agree to stand down for the period of the interim agreement. I think we will get something on that. But the, po the point is this. If there were no agreement, Jim, they would be able to continue every one of these activities full blast. So the agreement reins them in a bit, holds them to a steady state, and does two things. Two very practical things. One, it lengthens the time they would need for a nuclear breakout because they're standing down. And two, it lengthens the time we would have to react if they did try to break out. So just by those two standards, it makes sense for us. Now, a lot of, uh, at least reportedly, uh, the opposition to uh, the deal you've outlined comes from the French, who thinks it, yes. think it should be tougher. I think it was the French foreign minister, uh, Mr. Fabius, who said, our position has to do with the security of the region and world security. If there is nuclear proliferation, he said, that is, if more and more countries have nuclear weapons, that is obviously dangerous. So we are, and when I say we, I don't mean only France. It's all the countries, the international community, so that there is a right to nuclear power, but not to atomic weapons. So that is the French kind of hardline position. Why do they come to that position, and why do they differ with the English and, and the other Western powers, as well as the Chinese? Well, when I heard that it was the position of one of the negotiators in Geneva, I thought it was Dr. Frankenstein, not the French. <laughs> Uh, I never heard of a French socialist government taking such a tough position on anything. Well, it's but the answer is they took it, I think, for one reason, money. Money? Money. What, what do you mean by money? Where's the money? <laughs> what I mean Show me is, the money. Where's the money? <laughs> there's a lot of money because they've got tens of billions of dollars in new arms contracts with Saudi Arabia and the other uh, Gulf nations tens of billions, plus they have an Airbus contract for additional tens of billions. So I would say France's exports for the next 10 years are pretty much centered there. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Saudis picked up the phone and said, help us out. And the French, uh, of course, complied. But the objections they, they've raised, I think, are fair points when you come to the second stage of an agreement. The final For status. A comprehensive agreement, final status. We would want to pick up some of the points the French uh, have been advocating. But to try to do it all now is to put ourselves in the position of getting nothing. Because, as you know, Jim, you've spent your mm -hmm. life doing this stuff. In order to get, you have to give. We're not prepared to give very much on the sanctions, and we're not going to get everything in return without giving more. Well, uh, is uh, there something else behind it? Are they afraid of a, uh, if the Iranians break out or if the six-month agreement gives them more time to secretly enrich or to enrich in areas yeah. that aren't covered by the agreement, uh, that they will get the bomb in short order and then there will be a uh, nuclear arms race in the Middle East? Well, the hilarious part of, the, of, this, of this, Jim, is if there were no agreement, the Iranians could do precisely that. And do you think the French would say anything about it? Do you remember their saying anything about these matters over the last several years? I think there was utter silence from Paris. 
Now, when we uh, wanted to go into Iraq, the French certainly didn't support us. Uh, they didn't even say, we'll hold your coat. I guess this time they'll say, we'll hold your coat. I mean, if the military option is on the table, who's going to exercise the military option? And there, the United Israel, States or Israel? There's Israel and there's the United States. There's not France. Yeah. You know, what would the military option look like, Les, uh, as you see it? Well, Is it unthinkable? We, you know, it's very, very difficult. And I, I approve of the statement of the U.S. government that we're not going to take the military option off the table. I don't think the Iranians should feel that whatever they're going to do, uh, they can get away with it. Uh, they've got to understand that if push comes to shove and they do certain things, uh, we may have to take military action. Now, what would it look like? A lot of the facilities we're talking about here are deep underground. We have bunker busters that probably could get down pretty deep and probably could do some considerable damage uh, to those facilities. But I don't know a single intelligence officer who's dealt with this, Israeli or American, who does not believe if we did this, they would then, the Iranians would then, proceed to dig down even deeper and make it impossible for us to destroy those facilities by future air attacks. So they'd go right back to building nuclear weapons because they'd have even more reason to do so. Namely, they'd need it to deter future American and Israeli attacks. Uh, is it certain that any military strike on the part of Israel or the United States would come from the air? Uh, or would there be, uh, is there the possibility of commandos on the ground or a cyber attack? Right. Uh, We've been doing cyber attacks all, all along. along. And some of them have even been successful in slowing down the Iranian programs. And there is talk every now and then of commando attacks, and who knows, maybe the U.S. even put commandos on Iranian soil over the last 10, 20 years. Uh, so that, that, that might happen, but you can't count on something like that working in what is certain to be a very highly protected bunch of regions. Um then there would also be the fear of uh, some sort of reprisals around the world, would there not, in the form of terrorist attacks and uh, We'd have to um, assume U.S. That. interests? It would be utterly irresponsible for us to go after Iran's nuclear facilities without expecting that they would retaliate through their terrorist groups and through terrorist groups they support against us and against our allies. And everybody knows this is a serious risk, particularly Israeli intelligence and Israeli military. Uh, so which is scarier, if, uh, if Iran gets the bomb or if they don't get the bomb? <laughs> uh, I think it's best they don't get the bomb. It's best they don't get the bomb. Best they don't get but the bomb. But if they don't get the bomb because of military action on the part of the United States, that's pretty scary, too. Well, if that happened, as I said, I think over the long run they'd still pursue the bomb and they'd be bound to get it at a certain point. And uh, we'd have to expect the terrorist attacks as well. It would be utterly irresponsible not to assume this in our planning of any military attack against Iran. Now, which would come first in, uh, in fulfilling the interim agreement, the relaxation of sanctions or uh, their commitments to roll back, uh, at least partially, uh, their nuclear program. Yeah, I'm not sure of the exact timing, but I assume that uh, they would agree to stop certain functions. They've already, I haven't mentioned this, but they've already agreed uh, to have International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors come to their soil. They're there now doing far more extensive inspections than they have in many years. So that's another big plus to this agreement. We know better what's going on there because of these inspectors. So I think they'd have to stop doing certain things. The inspectors would verify it. And more or less at the same time, we would free up the money. Uh, well, if it's the Ayatollah's, the Supreme Leader's goal to um, 
have a bomb, at least at this point, or maybe that's not clear. Uh, why should he give us anything, knowing that uh, yes. we'd be, we really can't get the support in this country for an attack anyway? Right. Maybe well, he's worried about an Israeli attack, which is another question. Yes, that's a very good question. And as you know, the position I take on this is I don't know what what will happen after this interim agreement, whether the Iranians really are prepared to, in effect, cashier a nuclear weapons program. But you can only find out by doing. Nobody knows the answer to it. Only, how shall I put it nicely, baloney artists <laughs> assert that. The very fact that President Rouhani was elected president, the fact that he chose Zarif as his foreign minister, a very pragmatic guy, indicates that they were ready to bargain. But how much power these two guys have to deliver a comprehensive permanent deal on the Iranian nuclear program, we don't know and they don't know. When they were here in New York, Jim, uh, President Rouhani and Foreign Minister Zarif, I spoke to them and they didn't know either. And they, but they do know they're not the real powers in Iran. That the real power still rests with the Ayatollah Khamenei and with the Revolutionary Guard. So they're worried about getting support for what they're going to give too. But the Ayatollah put them forward as uh, the negotiators. Absolutely. And, and certainly approved they're representing themselves as reformers. Absolutely. And uh, so uh, we clearly have viewed them as credible trading partners, if you will. Yes, and they've done enough and said enough to indicate that we ought to test it. And this first stage agreement, this interim, interim freeze, is really the first step in a testing process. So one, one of the problems that we have uh, in, in the situation is that if, if Sweden decided mm -hmm. they wanted to have a nuclear bomb, I don't think very many people would be upset. Right. Uh, but uh, the specter of uh, crazy people in the Middle East having a, a nuclear bomb triggering an arms race, uh, giving it to terrorists who could bring dirty bombs into the country, I mean, it makes everyone very much afraid. Sure. Now, uh, one of the problems that we had before was they sent over Mr. Ahmadinejad, who said <laughs> he saw uh, the sun shining on him when he was addressing the General Assembly, and everybody was worried that he might be crazy. Now, they were worried, too, because they seemed to have dispatched him. And now we have these two others. But while well, these, uh, uh, and there was all this rhetoric against Israel, right. this sort of ranting and raving about Israel. Uh, then these people get into power, and the, during the course <laughs> of the negotiations, uh, they said, uh, and I'm sorry to belabor this, they said that Israel uh, is a rabid dog in the Middle East. A rabid dog. Now, of course, that's <laughs> filled with, uh, <laughs> and charged with uh, anti Semitic implications. Uh, you know, what do you make of all that? I think they're anti-Semitic. <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind or about that. Kissinger would say this is not helpful. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, John Kerry today said it was unnecessary remark. <laughs> what a wrong choice of words, as usual. Uh, look, uh, the Iranians don't love the Israelis and vice versa. Uh, but the question is, what's the best way to take care of the security of our deeply close ally the Israelis and our other friends in the area. And I think the first way is to try to see if we can deal with it, try to see if we can deal with it diplomatically. Now, you know, I said you got to look at it from both ends because it is, after all, a negotiation. We are negotiating with somebody who we can't simply dictate to. And here's what they say when we get into this kind of discussion about can you trust us and do you or you hate the Israelis, they say, look at the countries you've let acquire nuclear weapons without going to war. They're the crazy North Koreans. The, the Iranians say to us, who's crazier, the North Koreans or we Iranians? The answer is the North Koreans. Mm -hmm. They say the Pakistanis. Here's an unstable government. They lied to you. They cheated behind your back in order to acquire the nuclear weapons. They gave nuclear weapons technologies to other countries, including Libya, when Libya was a terrorist state. And what did you do about that? Nothing. 
Did you ever even threaten them? Not a chance. You hardly even took away the uh, substantial economic aid you gave them for many years. And India? Well, you let India acquire nuclear weapons, and you went even further. You said that all of the nuclear facilities in India run by the Indian military are exempt from international inspections. And now you say you can't make any kind of deal with us? So, you know, they've got, how shall I put it, a case. And they've got some grievances. And whether or not bad guys are in control of that place, our objective has got to be to see if we can build up enough pragmatists there to sustain limits on their nuclear program, to see if we can do it. Because if we can't, then the Revolutionary Guard <clears throat> and the radical clerics will proceed with the nuclear program. And that's precisely what we don't want. Well, of course, our policy toward North <clears throat> Korea and Pakistan uh, has been one of containment rather than prevention. Mm. And now as to Iran, the president drew a, uh, a red line. Yes, now, indeed. he drew a red line in Syria. That didn't work out quite the way he thought it would. <laughs> <laughs> but and then, I mean, does he have any credibility at all? As you say, we've been woefully inconsistent. Uh, not much. He doesn't. It's, uh, it's a very dangerous situation, in fact, when a president of the United States doesn't have credibility, as you know, Jim. That's the hardcore essence of what power is. <clears throat> People don't think you're going to do what you say. Uh, you haven't got much to, s to say that they'll listen to. So you don't think uh, Putin... Putin certainly <clears throat> pulled his uh, <clears throat> chestnuts out of the fire on Syria. Is, uh, are, the, are the Russians going to try to do something with the Iranians to uh, I don't make know sure what they, they live up do. to the agreement? I don't know what they can do. I don't think Putin is going to pull uh, a, a, a French move on this. <laughs> 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 and, uh, see if they can increase their exports to, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think uh, he is interested in seeing that Iran does not go nuclear. They've got a Muslim problem in Russia, very serious one. And I think they're afra afraid that a radicalized Iran will provide some sort of nuclear explosives to radical Muslims inside Russia. Azerbaijan and elsewhere with sure. the, the Muslim populations. Uh, now, in your uh, Daily Beast piece, where you uh, deplored the dogs of war that uh, right. <laughs> the hardliners are talking about. Uh, you said it would be a, uh, not only be a mistake, but it'd be futile if we did what Senators McCain and uh, Graham want to do, which is have even more sanctions on Iran and tighten the sanctions. Uh, what, what do you see as, uh, uh, as happening there? See, those are smart guys, yeah. Senators McCain and Lindsey Graham. And they know the drill. They know if we do this, that what it does is to strengthen the hand of the hardliners in Tehran who don't want to settle this problem diplomatically. I mean, how would we react if in the midst of this, the uh, uh, Iranians set off a small nuclear explosion mm. or started to, to increase the number of centrifuge runs? We'd go crazy. They would go or crazy. Or tested a bomb in their uh, underground silos. Any of those things. And so, you know, McCain and, and Graham know that that's, that's what would happen. I'm, I'm disappointed because I take them to be, you know, pretty smart conservatives who understand foreign policy and who understand that it's better for us to pursue a diplomatic track where we're not abandoning our leverage to see if there's a way of, to see if there's a way of resolving this without war. Well, if uh, we make a deal, even if we make a deal, do you think there'll be pushback from Congress? And, I mean, you have a number of Democratic senators who also sure. called uh, on Obama to be strong and be firm and not give in to the Iranians and make a bad deal. So... Uh, there will be pushback. But, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, a lot of being able to overcome that is how good the deal you make is and how good you are at explaining it. You know, what the devil is this administration doing to explain the negotiations 
to the American people, to the Congress. What Secretary of State Kerry is saying is, well, you have to understand that we think uh, no deal is better than a bad deal. What the devil does that mean? What is a bad deal? What is a good deal? Explain it. Explain what you think you're trying to get out of this so that people can begin to support you. You know, it's interesting. There was a Washington Post poll that came out today where 65% of the American people wanted a diplomatic settlement to these uh, uh, Iran and nu nuclear developments. 65%. Only 30% wanted to ratchet up the sanctions or, and or go to war. That's more common sense than being shown in Congress. Well, in, in fact, it's a kind of a reversal from what the attitude was toward our intervening in Syria, where 85 percent of uh, the American people thought it was a bad idea for us to intervene, yes. and so did, so did Congress. Yes. Um, so, Les Gelb, I have a question for you. And the question is, is any deal with Iran better than uh, no deal at all? No. No. You've got to get it a good deal. Depends on, and what defines a good deal in your view? A good deal is uh, anything and everything that makes it longer for them to actually break out and get a nuclear weapon. And anything you do to stop them now, freeze, or get them to dis dismantle certain equipment later on in a more comprehensive agreement will lengthen that time. It'll may take longer for them to do it. And it'll give us more time to react if we catch them. The goal is to have more time to react. I'm afraid we've run out of time. But thank you so much for coming sure, by, Jim. Les. This has been just marvelous. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations in the digital age. I'm Jim Zirin. Please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. I'm Jim Zirin. As I said, good night and all the best.